Uh, well, it's marvellous to see such a wonderful collection of people here and not new to these particular series of meetings. You're very welcome. We meet here every month and uh, we have a different talk each month and you're welcome to come along uh, to uh, our talks. Uh, uh, now, without any further ado, I'll hand over to Christian who normally gives us an excellent talk. This is his first talk, as I said to him earlier on this week, as a film star. <laughs> Ah, yes, that's right. Yes. Because, uh, everything is uh, is uh, recorded. And um, well, th thank you very much, David. Thank you for having me, and thank you all for taking the time to uh, come here this uh, this evening. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, warriors, uh, which is not generally the subject that uh, we tackle uh, here. And um, I will start with uh, Karl Marx. I think Marx is usually a very good place to, uh, to start uh, any discussion on uh, history or any analysis of uh, present day uh, situation. And, uh, and Marx has left us uh, five lessons which I think are very relevant and uh, very fertile. Uh, the first lesson, of course, is obviously his analysis of uh, the whole of history as uh, a class struggle, as uh, the uh, chasm uh, the in, inside uh, every society, not the hunter-gatherers and so on, but uh, all the societies that emerge in Neolithic time uh, when uh, the uh, number of people uh, in the society, members of the society, uh, exceeded several thousand, and meaning that there was an institution uh, to uh, coordinate these uh, actions, irrigation, building walls, building temples, uh, roads, and so on, and uh, a state was uh, created. And if you have a state, you have a ruling class. You have the people who control that state, and that is a second uh, lesson that we can get from uh, Karl Marx, the existence of this ruling class which extracts from the uh, producers in society a tribute in the form of taxes, in the form of um, uh, a, a, a part of what uh, the wealth they, uh, they create. And um, the ruling class, by its very nature, has to be small relative to the entire society. Because if you live from the predation of a producing class, if you take your tribute, you don't want to share it with too many people, or the share that each one will get will be too small. So. The question is, how come a small minority, ruling class representing no more than 15, at the most 20% of any uh, population in the historical society, how come this small society, this small ruling class, manages to control the vast majority? Okay, they have a state apparatus, they have the police, they have the army, uh, they have all sorts of uh, means of control, but uh, if people wanted to topple them, they would uh, easily simply buy the mass of people who would uh, raid uh, the, the palaces and, and so on. And another contribution uh, of Marx is to say, well, the ruling class creates an ideology. And this ideology is adopted by the entire society. The concepts, the ideas, the vocabulary, the beliefs, the values, are transmitted by a, uh, a number of priests, a number of teachers, philosophers, of intellectuals, which means that the people in society, the exploited class, doesn't even understand its exploitation. I think this concept goes a lot further than Ayn Rand's sanction of a victim, because it's, it is like in, in a uh, good... Um, uh, crime novel, uh, when a perfect crime is the one that no one knows is a crime. And in a uh, society where the ideology is working very well, there isn't a sanction of a victim because the victim doesn't perceive herself as being a victim. She simply adopts the values of society and believes that the way society is constituted is perfectly normal. That is how it should be. And the fifth lesson that uh, Marx teaches us is that, well, despite all this, despite the state apparatus, despite coercion, and despite an ideology, 
There are times when things change. There are times when the ruling class is toppled and a new situation emerges. And this comes when the discourse, the ideological discourse, is so far from the reality that people experience that they can no longer believe what they are being taught. It is like, you know, this joke for Karl, the um, Marx Brothers, the other Marx, uh, Marx Brothers uh, joke, you know, are you going to believe your own eyes or are you going to believe what I'm telling you? So people, think, in the end, believe their own eyes. And, um, but it's very difficult because it's, you have to um, understand what is going on. And the vocabulary doesn't allow you to understand this. I mean, example that I came across a uh, long time ago, which suddenly awakened me to what was uh, happening in ideology, was when uh, the uh, group of French sort of um, activists launched what, they, what was called at the time pirate radios, at the time when in France it was a monopoly of radios by uh, the state. And um, so the state tried to impose the, the word pirate radio. And it didn't work because these activists who were operating these radios called them free radios as opposed to state radios. And everybody said, well, you know, we are in favor, in favor of free radios, not state radios. But then the ruling class in France mobilized all its intellectuals, the media, you know, teachers, and so on, and changed the vocabulary from private commercial radios and public service radios. It was exactly the same thing that was described, but with a different vocabulary. And opinion swayed and decided that public service radio is a good thing. <laughs> private commercial radio is bad. So this is how it works. The latest example of this is uh, jungle. Who wants to protect jungles? But if you call it rainforest, it's exactly the same thing. But rainforest is something that you do want to protect. So that is how ideology works and how difficult it is to awaken people to the reality of their exploitation. And of course, and this is Marx's fifth lesson, the people who can do this and accelerate the movement is an avant-garde, as we are, as you know, libertarians are in this society. In other words, an avant-garde who has understand the mechanism of exploitation and is capable to spread the idea and tell people, look, you are being told this, but this is the reality. So having sort of you know, very briefly and, uh, and sketching um, reminded everybody what you know, Marx's analysis is, I would like to bring a twist to it. I would like to um, bring another angle and invite in this conversation a French linguist, anthropologist, and so on, Georges Dumézil. Georges Dumézil died in 1986 after a very long life. And he worked in Turkey, he, uh, where he taught, uh, he worked in the Caucasus and, uh, and so on. And he is famous for many very learned books, which all revolve around one concept in Indo-European societies. I mean, all the societies that emerge 4,000, 5,000 years ago from India and then spread to Iran, spread to the Caucasus, to the Slavic countries, to the Nordic countries, the Viking, Greece, Rome, and so on. In all these societies, you have not a binary division, but a tripartite division of societies. You have a caste of rulers, kings, priests, uh, and you have a, class, a caste of warriors. And then you have a producer. Economically, of course, it's the same. In the sense, I mean, it doesn't refute what Marx was saying, because both castes of kings and priests and warriors lived off the surplus value created by the producers. But it brings an interesting aspect when you consider ideology. And what um, I, I would like to explain is the very special position of warriors in this situation and why ideologically it functions quite well to um, uh, blind people 
to the reality of the exploitation. What are warriors doing? And why do they enjoy a high consideration in all these societies, in the, I mean, you know, from India, from Persia, from, you know, and so on, Nordic and so on. Always, priests and warriors were at the top. Producers were at the bottom. In terms of social status, privileges, um, consideration, and, 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 and so on. And you wonder, after all, I mean, society needs carpenters, societies need farmers, societies need herdsmen and fishmongers and uh, craftsmen and so on. So why would these people who create the wealth in society always be down at the bottom of the, of the pile? And uh, it um, uh, sounds uh, a bit sort of odd in terms of you know, what we experience and, uh, uh, and uh, how we view ourselves, but even now, actually, uh, there are certain societies, and I'll come to that uh, later, where the function of producers was a function that was looked down upon by people who had a kind of moral high ground. And in a 1995 book, I, I, I found this, uh, called, uh, the book is called Ethics and Public Service. I found this quote, which in a very flowery style, explains very well what is taking place. Man's feet may wallow in the bog of self-interest, but his eyes and ears are strangely attuned to the call of a mountaintop. There is a distinction between I want this because it is in my self-interest and I want this because it is right. Man's self-respect is in large part determined by his capacity to make himself and others believe that self is an inadequate referent for decisional morality. This capacity of man to transcend, to sublimate, and to transform narrowly vested compulsions is at the heart of all civilized morality. And there you have it. In other words, you have the opposition between what is right and this is what the warriors are doing, this is what the priests are doing, and what is in your self-interest. And this, of course, is what producers are doing. And in all these societies, there is a kind of higher moral ground that is occupied by people who claim that what they are doing is not dictated by their self-interest, but only dictated by some higher cause, higher consideration, higher ideal, which is doing what is right. Now, if we look at the specific position of the warriors, what we have is a power relationship, which is, which is really a debt relationship. When you are producers and you trade, you buy something, you pay for it, the deal is done. There is nothing that is owed by one party to another. But when you have a warrior, a warrior who is prepared to lay down his life to protect you, who sometimes does die in battle protecting you, how do you pay them? What is the worth of a warrior. Pounds, ounces of gold, the debt can never be paid. And the only way that you can manifest your consideration is by giving the warrior a higher status, a higher position, higher consideration, a moral high ground, and power. That is how you pay warriors. That is how they manage their, to keep their situation above the producers in all societies, simply because we owe them a debt that can never be repaid, that can never be extinguished. So what we have is a relationship to death. The bourgeois, the producers, the farmers, and so on, are 
driven by nature. They are driven by a force that Spinoza calls the force through which each thing perseveres in its being. They value life. There is nothing for a capitalist that is more depressing than to be the richest man in the graveyard. But the warrior is on the riverbank of death. The warrior is against nature. It is against nature to die when you are 20, 22, without beget begetting a progeny, without begetting children. It is unnatural to die for something that is not defending your own life, because sometimes you are not defending your own life, you are defending actually a country, a cause, and, and, and so on. You are not on the menace, you are attacking. And it is totally unnatural to live the sort of life that warriors do live, in the sense of um, being separate from your family, being um, in the, the sort of environment of the army and so on, without women, without uh, you know, uh, the joys of life in society and, uh, in, um, and so on. So I think the uh, situation that <clears throat> we have is a situation that some people have tried to explain, sociobiologists, for instance, have tried to explain why, after all, people die altruistically, but really because they want to protect the transmission of their genes. Animals do this. But that, is may, that may be true in very small tribal environment where everyone is a cousin of everyone else, but not in the large societies that we are talking about, where people are not at all kin. They are not at all linked by family ties and, and, and so on. The reason the warrior is fighting is not to protect people who, are, who share his own genes, other than being human genes, but then the enemy also has human genes. Uh, the warrior is really fighting for a cause, for something that is transcendent. The other explanation is to say, well, warriors are men. Men like battle. You know, testosterone is driving them, and uh, they want to fight. That's what big boys do. But that is actually not at all what war is about. That is what fist fights are about. That is what uh, pub brawls are about. Because when you are in a fit of rage, your hand tremble, your vision is obscured by rage. And war is actually exactly the reverse. War is a cold calculation. War is uh, something that you do in um, all you know, the great strategists have shown how war is sort of planned, organized, and done with uh, you know, the most technicality that they can find at the age where they are. And today, even more so. I mean, <clears throat> I was reading in Wired magazine the other day how a, um, uh, you, know, you have these sort of people who drive in the morning, you know, commute to an air base in Texas or in uh, Nevada, and sit you know, at 8 o'clock in the morning in front of a cockpit, and they pilot a drone which is flying over Afghanistan or Iraq. And they get a message from people in the ground saying, uh, look at this pickup truck. We think there are Taliban's in there. So the guy sort of shoots a, uh, from Houston, shoots a missile out of a drone that is flying over you know, some place in Afghanistan, kills a few people, then goes back home in the evening you know, and have a drink and watch television and talks to his wife and children. That is, uh, of course, today's technological sort of war game type of, of war. But even at the time of Jews Caesar, at the time of you know, Napoleon and so on, it was very planned, it was very organized, and uh, you know, it, it had to be uh, like this in order to be efficient. And, and of course, the third thing is, well, we all die, don't we? 
So what is the big difference between, yeah. you know, yeah. a warrior and, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, the, the rest of us? Well, there is a big difference. I don't follow, I don't follow a multitude to do evil. Start dying. <laughs> well, it's not exactly this. Is that producers, let's say us, we die from something. We die from old age, from accidents, from illness, from the whims of nature. The warrior dies for something. He dies for the country, for the king, for revolution, for a cause. And Oswald Spengler mentioned that, you know, the death of people is part of history. These people are history. They constitute history. Warriors make history. They are not made by history. They are the ones who make it. And that is a very big difference. That is what separates uh, the death of warriors from the death of the vast majority of all the others. And the uh, Fukuyama actually uh, mentioned that you know, the end of empires run by warriors was the end of history, precisely because nothing would make history anymore. It would be simply producers trading and so on in an environment of, you know, elected politicians who are all sort of more or less coming from the bourgeoisie and, and so on. It would be the end of history. It doesn't work like this, but not yet. Um, the other thing that I think is interesting is uh, that there is a um, a uh, special situation that has always been given to warriors in society, physically. Um, you see this in Plato. Plato says, you know, the caste of warriors has to be segregated from the rest of society. You see this in the chivalry. You see this, of course, in nobility and so on. And you see this in modern day. I mean, you know where warriors are in bases and barracks and, uh, and, and so on. And why is this? And I think there is a good reason for this, is that the, the military, with its acceptance of death and, uh, and, and so on, um, shows the human conscience state of, um, or stand against biology. And, uh, that is why, actually, it's against evolution. And that is why the death of warriors is always sort of pathetic, or grandiose, or tragic, and, and so on. But also, because warriors live by an inverted morality, warriors do not have the, the beliefs and the values that the producers have. In order to be good, a warrior has to be bad. A warrior has to cheat, has to deceive, has to spy, has to do all the things that the producers are not allowed to do. And of course, he has to kill without remorse. We are told when you are producers that you want to do unto others what you want others to do unto you. Well, the warrior doesn't want that. The warrior wants to do unto others what he doesn't want others to do unto him. I'm saying him because warriors historically have always been men until very recently. Warriors have no place for negotiation, for cooperation, and certainly they don't expect a win-win conclusion. There is no win-win conclusion. There is a defeat of the enemy. There is conquest. There is plunder. So all the values that make a good warrior are the values that are not allowed producers to producers. And therefore, in order to protect the society of producers, warriors have to be cast aside. 
They have to be segregated. They have to live in another environment, separate, separated from the rest of us. And also, the reverse is true. Because in order to live the life of a warrior, you don't want to be contaminated, or certainly your officers don't want you to be contaminated by the joys, by the delights of life in a producing society. You don't want to be in contact with women, family, children. And the life of a warrior is not the life of war. It's the life of preparation to war. And preparation to war is in barracks, with drills, with uh, quick step marches, uh, training, discipline, and so on, and all a preparation that is not unlike the life of the other caste that Dumézy was saying, the caste of priests in monasteries. Because both priests and warriors are always subjected to the temptation of the life of producers. Cooperation, delights, sex, amusement, and so on. So they have to be kept separate. But especially warriors have to be kept separate so that they don't contaminate the rest of society with their inverted morality. And that's why producers like the warriors to be apart and didn't want them to in lose their special status where they could come and infect the rest of society. They declared that would be ignoble. It would not be noble. So we have a situation where all warriors and so on are subject to you know, the delights of Capua. And you have, in order to protect this segregation, you have the whole apparatus, ideological apparatus, of teachers, intellectuals, um, uh, you know, priests, uh, media, and so on, uh, who say, well, public service is good. The call for a higher cause is good. Self-interest is bad. Self-interest is for you know, the vile people, the bankers, the merchants, the uh, uh, people in the stock exchange, and, and, and so on. Um, people who are above that actually are your moral superiors. So I hope all this is interesting, but what is the relevance to today's situation? Where do we place this sort of horizon that uh, uh, I've briefly sketched um, in today's sort of society? And how does it help us understand what is happening? I think in, in more than one way. First of all, since the 1930s, um, with the New Deal, and certainly with beverage plan and social democracies and, and, and so on, up until the 1990s, the state ideology was to say the state is necessary because it is our protector. It was no longer the ideology of saying we defend Christianity or we bring civilization to the savages, or we uh, want to become the most powerful country in Europe, in the world, and so on. The ideology was, we protect you. We protect you from the Soviet Union. We protect you from barbarians. We protect you from uh, want, as Roosevelt said, illness, old age, poverty, and, and so on. And that discourse is slowly losing its credibility. First of all, because there is no longer the threat of an invasion. 
which was real until the 1980s. And we, it becomes very clear to most people today that this um, claim of a state being able to protect you doesn't work in a globalized world where innovation, where what is happening in other countries and, and so on, where uh, the gyrations of the stock market and the movements of finance and so on are completely outside the control of the state. But it, it is still the legitimizing discourse of the ruling class. The ruling class says you need to pay tribute because we are protecting you. Now, a protection is either the function of a mafia or the function of a warrior. And what you have is a situation where bureaucrats for the past sort of 60 years have cloaked themselves in the mantle of warriors to explain what they are doing. And you see it physically. I mean, there isn't a ceremony of bureaucrats without a band, a military band, without a guard of honor, without anthems being played, flags being raised, all these sort of things. I mean, when, you know, very civilian David Cameron goes anywhere, there are military sort of, you know, who are there and to welcome him, the guard of honor and, uh, and, and, and so on. So you have a situation where the modern state is an institution of living pseudo-soldiers, pseudo-warriors, who rule on, in the name of real dead soldiers, real dead warriors. And you see this in textbooks, you know, we, you see this in the streets, look at the names of the streets, look at, you know, the monuments and so on, generals, people who have killed, people who have plundered, but they are the ones who we honor. They are the people who have made this country. They have made our history. And even more so, you know, people in France, even more so in America, which is a much more militaristic society than uh, we are here. And these people can say, well, bureaucrats can say, well, I'm not acting in my self-interest, right? I am serving a state. How could what I do be blamed when it is for the interest, for the service of a state for which so many people have died? Isn't that cause sacred? A cause doesn't, I mean, you don't die for a sacred cause. A cause becomes sacred because people have died for it. And not supporting this cause is an insult to the people who have led their lives to make it what it is uh, today. So state officials claim that because they are serving the state for which people have died, they should live by the same morality that warriors do. In other words, they can lie for the higher cause. They can deceive for raison d'etat. They can spy. They can cheat. And this is a bizarre situation in the sense that the warriors who do, who did, live by this inverted morality atoned by their death. Bureaucrats have nothing to face than retirement with full pay. So there is a big difference in the claim of living by the morality of warriors and being able to cheat, lie, deceive, spy, and so on in the name of the higher cause. There is more resistance in this country to the morality of warriors. Why? Because you are exclude myself, uh, you are a nation of shopkeepers. You always had a higher, you always placed a higher value on producers than, say, on the continent. 
certainly in France, for instance, being part of a public service is something that puts you much higher in terms of social status and so on than working for a company, even if you make a lot of money. Actually, especially if you make a lot of money. So there is a warrior ideology that is less prevalent in this country than it is in America or than it is on the continent. But it still exists. It is still there. And what I wanted is draw attention to this because us, as vanguard of the Liberation Party, as the people who have understood the exploitation that you know, the whole country is subjected to by the ruling class, I think it is necessary that we understand all these little nuances and so on, so that we can make other people aware of what's happening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Are there any questions or contributions? Yes, Patrick, Patrick. was frowning be... during my old talk. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, this is going to be garbled because uh, I, was, I was struggling throughout the talk to, to to map what you were saying in principle to the, re the reality I I observed. Mm -hmm. Now, first of all, there's this idea that the the ruling class has to be necessarily small. It seems to me right now it's extremely large. The number of people who managed to take my money in various forms, um, the unemployed, the unemployable, etc., uh, seems to be extraordinary. Um, and actually, one of the problems we face is there just aren't enough me's and rather too many of them's. Um, the other thing was the who the idea that, of, of the ruling class gaming. I struggle to think. I don't know. Do, do the ruling class really gain? I was thinking about you know, the life of Tony Blair. I mean, if Tony Blair stayed as a lawyer, surely he'd be a lot better off than the life he leads now. Most, and that's, that's if you get to the top. I mean, if you, if, you, if you don't get to the top, it's a life of utter misery in politics. And I thought, so also, also in civil service, service would by and large not get paid that much, unless you get a right to the top. So, yeah, I wasn't... Okay, well, there are, there are two questions. Uh, sorry, you, you had another no, point? Well, I had a third one, I forgot the words. <coughs> okay. Um, I think that, yes, one of the problems that the ruling class faces today is the extension of the ruling class. In other words, the number of predators that are living off the rest of us. And it's a dialectic of the wolves and the caribou, you know, which is one of the first ecological sort of uh, studies that have been uh, made. Uh, if you have too many wolves, they kill too many caribous, so the wolves go hungry and, and they die, so the caribous can sort of, you know, prosper again. So then the wolves that are left sort of, you know, and, and so on. So what we have today is a situation where you have too many wolves and not enough caribous. And this is a situation that you get at the end of a cycle. It is a situation that you had in France in the 18th century. Uh, because uh, the state, I mean the king, was pressed his finances and so on, um, he was selling, you know, selling titles of nobility to a lot of people who then no longer paid taxes, but they paid immediately. But then, you know, they no longer paid. So after some time, you had a diminishing population of people who were paying taxes to keep up Versailles and wars and, and all these sort of things. So you have a situation today which is brought about by democracy and so on. And the second point you are making about, you know, people, ruling class, not making money, that is exactly what I was saying. They are not there to make money. They are there for power. They are there because they hear the mountaintop, you know, the call of the mountaintop and, and, and so on. So that is what they consider actually to be their higher moral ground. They are not in it for the money, for personal gain. I mean, it, sounds, it sounds like they've been conned too. They? They've been, they, they been conned as well. I think they've been conned by politics. is a, a funny thing in society that serves no one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nick? Yeah. Um, to that, um, I'm, I'm wondering, I think there's an interesting way of looking, looking to uh, how society works. 
And but I'm, I'm also not sure if it's if it's at least still true what you're saying, because um, not only is the ruling class growing, but there is also not that much of an awareness. Many people who I would consider being the ruling class, they are not aware that they are the ruling class at all. And um, so my problem with this whole look at, um, with this. Um, dividing a society into ruling class, you know, warriors and, and producers is a little bit that it sounds a bit like a conspiracy theory where a group of people actively decides to conspire against like producers and but it, it's, it's not really very active. Isn't, isn't it just a system that, that no one really, as, as David just says, it doesn't serve really anyone anymore. It just, it has a dynamic and um, no one really is, is, is aware of, 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 its, of uh, his own position in, in, the, in the society anymore, like it was in, in, in maybe the Middle Ages, or there, where, you had a ruling, where you had a ruling class who was very aware that they were the ruling class, and they, was very aware, uh, they were very aware that they were exploiting some people and so on. So there it may have worked really as a kind of conspiracy theory, but today I'm, 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 I think it's not really wrong to see it like this, but it's, it, it's not always helpful as well. I think that what ideology does is precisely blind both the exploiters and the exploited to the reality of the exploitation. Because you wouldn't want to be the one saying, I'm exploiting you, I'm a looter, I'm a plunderer. That is something that even if you are a warrior, you cannot accept for your own sort of moral satisfaction. So what noblemen, up until more or less the Enlightenment, for instance, on continental Europe and saying, we are saying is that it was just and proper that we are the aristocracy. Etymologically, we are the best. We are not exploiting. It is our God-given, literally God-given position on earth <coughs> to be where we are. And likewise, I mean, you know, the Serbs and so on, considered that, no, we are not exploited. It is the way the world should be. We are at the, in the position that God has put us on this earth to be. So what is happening, I think, is that more and more people today realize that the situation that is, that exists now, no longer really corresponds to the ideology that they are taught and told. And this is when revolutions take place. And this is when, you know, the scales fall off the eyes of both the exploiter and the exploited. But I mean, again, the situation that Marx describes, or the situation, you know, that the ideology creates and so on, is that it blinds both the exploiters and the exploited. Uh, Bob? Uh, Marx himself um, uh, acknowledged that he didn't create the class analysis. And he worked, that was the French liberals. And of course, theirs wasn't quite the same as his. Theirs was always those who used the state to advance their interests. I mean, Marx, of course, it became the bourgeoisie, the, uh, the capitalists, the owners, rather than the state. They might use the state as their uh, executive, committee. executive committee, yes. But um, other times they might not. So, uh, of course, you're not, you're using Marx as a, as a way of introducing the topic. I don't suppose you're actually taking the line. I don't know much you're not. But in all of this, it wasn't clear, and it, it, in a sense it doesn't matter. I think it was Oscar Wilde pointed out that you don't have to believe everything you're arguing for, because you might be wrong. <laughs> and what you're arguing for as a mere exercise could be correct. And you might convince yourself eventually. So um, it wasn't clear whether you thought that was the position of warriors, or that was the ideology of the position of warriors. In other words, that they are selfless, they do stand apart. Because if you've, any, if you've met any of them, You'll find that they're fairly ordinary folk. After all, careerists, wives and families, looking after, looking for a pension, wanting a nice, safe little war to be involved in. And also, once they are involved in a war, it's not uh, those who do the fighting. 
it's not so well planned and so um, cool and rational. I think there's an awful lot of bellowing and swearing and uh, yes, and <laughs> shouting on the radio. <laughs> if you're a fighter pilot, so uh, what point am I getting to here? Um, uh, yes, it, it, we must try an impossible distinction between the sociology and the the ideology. You know? Uh, what is going on, what is said to be going on. Uh, that might, uh, might make it a little easier, but uh, yeah, that would be my point, I think, if it is a point. Mm. But uh, a further one that I like, I like to insist upon, because there's so much confusion in the philosophy of these things, about the idea of self-interest. I like to clarify it, and I think it does clarify it, to say, look, there are selves with interests, and that's that. And there always will be. Every saint, every sinner, is a self with an interest. Now it might be they will starve, they will, <coughs> they will suffer death, they will suffer, suffer the final agonies to serve some interest. Mm. But they are selves with interests, and the saints, sadly, do the, can do the most damage, can do the most harm once they're in power, or the people they encourage to, to find positions of power, mm. to use in a saintly way. So I'm, I'm not accusing you of this, but uh, I, I do think it causes a great deal of confusion to contrast the self-interested with selves who do not have interests. There are only selves with interests. Yeah, well, of course, if people are acting, they are acting for a reason. Yeah. So uh, call it interest or call it whatever. But I mean, there, there is certainly a reason. Um, what generally people understand by self-interest is something that is more material. And um, on the point of, yes, I mean, Marx borrowed uh, the concept of ideology from Destut de Tracy and uh, borrowed the concept of class wars from Saint-Simon, 1818, and, and so on. And um, there is what he missed, of course, where the protagonists in the class war that is raging today. In other words, it, he, because he had a wrong conception of what created value, economic value, and he believed that it was labor. He, do, he took this from Adam Spaeth and Ricardo and, and, and so on. And he struggled with a with, with concept. I mean, actually, there is something, it's my, one of my pet theories, uh, and I don't think that I'll ever be able to prove it. But I mean, if you look at, what's, at Marx's biography, he wrote on the labor theory of value and, and so on. He wrote in the manuscript of 1848 and uh, for 1844 and so on. And then 1867, he publishes a complete theory, labor theory, in the first term of the capital, 1867, the same year as Alice in Wonderland. And in 1871, and he continues you know, preparing the second term and so on. 1871, he publishes his reflections on the civil war in France, the Paris Commune and so on. And then he publishes nothing until 1883, where he publishes his notes on Richard Wagner, and he dies. This man, who has been so prolific, cannot complete tome two and tome three of the capital. Engels will publish it later. And what I think is that in 1871, Marx read Karl Menger's Principles of Economics. He read everything. He was voracious. He couldn't have missed Karl Menger's book, which had a certain impact. And I think Marx at that time went... <laughs> <laughs> because that is, the subjective theory of labor is so, I mean, clearer, so gives us such a better understanding of what's happening in the economic world than the labor theory. But by 1871, Marx was already the head of the First International, Socialist International, his reputation has been made. He couldn't go back and said, guys, I completely fucked. You know, I, it's not at all what I said. So he had to work around, and we see in you know, the posthumous publications of the tome two and three of Capital, how you know, he struggled with his concept of labor theory and he rewrites it and he re-expounds it and so on, and it doesn't hold water. And he had to understand that it doesn't, you know, he had to realize that it doesn't hold water. But I think he couldn't go back. 
I think, uh, of course, that many people have come across that. Yeah, well, there's, 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 my former self as well. But it is actually in Hayek, fatal conceit. Mm. Um, oh, I can't um, You described America as more militaristic mm. uh, than Europe. Um, I think it may be true in the sense that America does have a more ingrained warrior caste than would be the case here. But America is also a country which sort of fetishizes almost its sort of entrepreneurship and its business class, and at least at least a sort of. I think I think being being a successful businessman and being being involved in industry is probably something which gets you higher social status in the U.S. than it does here, just the same. So. America, perhaps, is, is, is in, in a way a nation of shopkeepers as well as a nation of the great warrior caste. So, which just makes me think that perhaps seeing this as a sort of polar thing is not a very good way of looking at it. Maybe America is more divided on the red state, blue state thing than the European countries are. Well, that's it. it's interesting that you say this. <clears throat> But, of course, what Dumézil would say is how do we represent ourselves? People would say of businessmen in America and, and so on, that yes, they made a lot of money, and yes, we have nothing against that. In a way, it is a necessary evil. In a way, it is nature. It is not civilization. That is exactly the point I was making. People who follow their self-interest simply follow nature, biology, evolution. The people who are on the side of civilization are the people who are the priests and the warriors and the artists. And this is how mythology has always been constructed. So the higher call The mountaintop is occupied by the people who resist the lucre, who resist the desire to make a lot of money and become the great scientists, the great artists, the priests, the warriors, and, and, and so on. So yes, America will accept that people make a lot of money, but they don't enjoy the consideration, the moral high ground that people, you know, as I said, you know, warriors, priests, and so on, artists have. And, and you see this, I mean, apart from Ayn Rand's rather cardboard characters in uh, Atlas Shrugged and, uh, and, and so on, I mean, you see that all the great epics, or great films, or great and so on, always show the hero as being someone who is disinterested, I mean, not pursuing money and so on, And the people who pursue money are the villains. Uh, Martin Scorsese made a film, The Aviator, which presented Howard Hughes. Yes, a few, that's um, right. I'm sure Steve Jobs sees what he is doing in civilization too. Um, but Martin Scorsese made a film, The Aviator, which presented Howard Hughes. Yes, but people would say, of course, but he makes a lot of money. Yes, but I think you still celebrate what he does to make that money. Yes, but people would say, of course, but he makes a lot of money. Yes, but people would say, of course, but he makes a lot of money. Yes, but people would say, of course, but he makes a lot of money. Yes, but people would say, of course, but he makes a lot of money. Yes, but people would say, of course, but he makes a lot of money. Yes, but people would say, of course, but he makes a lot of money. Yes, but people would say, of course, but he makes a lot of money. Yes, but people would say, of course, but he makes a lot of money. Yes, but people would say, of course, but he makes a lot of money. Yes, but people would say, of course, but he makes a lot of money. Yes, but people would say, of course, but he makes a lot of Yes, it, uh, it isn't Bob Saint that I find worrying. I can't think of Saint in particular, it scares me. Maybe he will be dying in the But we won't go into the details. Uh, it's always the philosopher of the kings. Uh, now, if we include in that Marx, then it looks like Marx was at least bright enough to realise he hadn't got a reply. This was an example in the philosophy of a poor enough where you give your opponent such an argument that he's simply reduced to silence. And that's something to be said. And it's funny that I'm not necessarily dishonest. He treated it as an anomaly. It was just an anomaly that wouldn't go away for decades. He seems racking his brains for an answer. Well, then somebody like Alan Ryan, who uh, writes that he can make no sense whatsoever of the idea that people have any right to their pre-tax incomes. Because everything they have is the bounty of the state. Mm. And if the state says you own it, you own it. If it says you don't, you don't. So it's just crazy to think that it could be interfering with you in any way. Um, this man is paid to know better. <laughs> <laughs> this is what Saint-Simon um, 
says in, um, I mean, he narrates that uh, Louis XIV, um, after the war against Holland and so on, was very despondent because he realized that, you know, he was taxing his subject uh, to the point where they were starving and uh, there were actually revolts in Brittany and, uh, and so on. And he went to Père Lachaise, I mean, to his uh, confessor, gave his name to the cemetery in Paris. And uh, Lachaise and Benny came out of confession and uh, smiling and bright and so on. And he, Saint-Simon says, Lachaise told him that because all the subjects' money belongs to the king, the king was generous enough to leave them what he didn't take. So reverse the situation. And Louis XIV was convinced by that, easily convinced. <laughs> Nick, I think you want to say something. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, I thought going back to your, your conceptualization of, I suppose, the, the warrior mentality and also how warriors have to be perceived by the populace, I was wondering if there's any way that that could map on to the weakness that the... I suppose the um, various classes in, in society today are kind of particularly exposed to things like sex scandals or scandals involving their personal activity or interests or their kind of uh, or, or their desires in general because it kind of damages the the kind of vision of them kind of having uh, no no personal interests in the way that um, you know kind of ordinary bourgeoisie you might kind of expect it of them. So I was wondering if, you know, the way that, you know, people seem to get tripped up, you know, whether they're kind of famous journalists or academics or politicians or, or you know, people in kind of particularly sensitive roles such as police officers, social workers and other uh, teachers, <coughs> group, groups like that, they are particularly exposed to the problem of when their personal life might be revealed in, uh, in, 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 a, in a public setting. It's also partly how this kind of maps onto things like criminal records bureau checks, which of course designed partly to be a way of kind of uh, preventing um, particular classes from being contaminated with, you know, the kind of normal everyday activities in some ways that um, the pe that um, I suppose the, the bourgeoisie get get to have. There are some jobs that one cannot uh, become involved in if you've been accused of this or if you've uh, been involved with that. I, I was wondering if, if you felt that that was a, a legitimate way of thinking about it. Yes, and I think it is a sign that the ruling class is actually decomposing, and um, which is, you know, among many other signs, the fact that we are shifting from one type of exploitation to, hopefully, a libertarian world. In other words, that Marx's revolution, which he said, you know, would be the last, um, uh, the uh, uh, sort of class struggle that we are living, would be the last. And because I think that a classless society is a stateless society in the sense that the only ruling class is the class of people who control the state. If you no longer have a state, you no longer have division of society between classes and exploiters and exploited. <clears throat> so what we are seeing is the change in the means of production, you know, things like this, globalization, all this sort of thing, IT and, and so on. But we are seeing the decaying moral values of the ruling class, which is being contaminated by the bourgeoisie, you know, as, as, as you describe it. And they are losing their moral high ground. We no longer have respect for them. I mean, the Daily Mail still says, you know, our heroes in Afghanistan. But, as Bob was saying, you know, the soldiers today want to have the same life as other people, they want to have a family, and so on. Um, so, you know, it's, it's all falling apart. Uh, in other words, it's all going right. They've even, had, they've even had health and safety in the army, haven't they? Which is, which is marvellous. Okay, I mean, I just think about a... A, a shopkeeper in uh, Tunisia, probably late last year, who decided to meet a higher calling and then immolated himself. 
Well, this man was not a quarry, and yet his action started a series of quite radical events. Continue to live with. Um, it seems that, and, and this is where I probably have the problem with, 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 with the entire talk here, is you create this thing called the state. The state we understand that we live with today, a state which is recognizable, probably back down to the 18th and 17th and maybe 16th centuries, and see earlier iterations in the Roman Empire and so on. But then you fold it back all the way through, and you fold in lots of other diverse societies within that. So it becomes Germanic tribes, it becomes uh, uh, the sort of Scythians, nomads, the, the Mongols. And, and that's why I sort of have a, a very difficult, uh, I have a difficulty with, with this universalization, what is a, a, a complex and diverse slew of societies, which are all molding into one. Um, <coughs> do you think you're, you're reading back from now into the past? That essentially what you're saying, here's what I would like the world to be, Here's where I think it is going. Here's what I think has happened in the past, because you said the state is essentially the source of all these castes and ideologies and ideas and the way people perceive themselves. Although, if you look at it, in societies which are demographically thin, the producers actually are the product. So I, I, I just... Do you think, just as these castes trapped by their ideology, that perhaps you yourself are in effectively extending this state back through history uh, when the evidence can't quite support what you wish for? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, it's a valid point, but I don't think, I think I made clear, or I hope I did, that I was talking of organized states but ones that emerged in Asia Minor, Egypt, and Rome, and so on, where you had a state apparatus. And I excluded the hunter-gatherers, the nomads, and things like this, where there isn't a state structure, but is loyalty to a chief. Could be a king, could be someone elected by the uh, uh, sort of um, warlords as being primum, primus inter Paris. But the real, I mean, in order to have a class, you have to have a structure that imposes certain rules of exploitation. So it has to be organized. It's not simply the big man who comes and says, this is mine. That is not a class. That is a mafia, that is a, a gang. So um, a state is something that has a bureaucracy, that has certain rules, enforces these rules. I mean, you know, Max Weber and, and, and all these sort of things. So that is where you have a... And in, in this, I mean, I only follow Marx and Engels. Um, this is where you have a division between classes and, and struggle between these classes and production of an ideology that is relayed, that is formulated, relayed and spread by intellectuals, clergy, you know, teachers and, uh, and, and so on. Intellectuals and... Oh, Bob. Um, how much is the uh, warrior ideology in the past and today tied in with notions such as um, Malthusian view of life, the, um, the green view of life, the uh, zero sum game or negative sum game <laughs> approach to the world, the idea that what one gains and other must have lost? Firstly, um, simply as a part of a sort of economic analysis of history or things, and also almost detrimentally. <laughs> Someone such as Hitler, for example, why not bring him in? He usually arrives within three moves. <laughs> um, 
even if you could understand the sort of Cobden and Bright view of um, trade and uh, the anti Malthusian view that, no, 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 the more the merrier, we can, all, we can all prosper together. Now, I think he might have understood it, but a warrior might say, that's no way for a nation to live. <laughs> what kind of life is that? Where's the glory in that? Now, I think he didn't understand the arguments, but also many people are temperamentally drawn to the idea that the higher life, the lower life, the warrior caste, the rude mechanicals, and, and also the, the greenery idea that, that living, up, living too well will ruin things, um, that greed will undermine itself. Is that, that the case, do you think? Yes, I think there is uh, this. And I think that certainly part of the Green Movement is actually <coughs> resentment against the good life, against the life of the consumers, the life of, uh, you know, th there is this sort of hair shirt mentality in uh, a lot of people who call themselves Greens and, and so on to say that we have it too good. You know, we should be more sober, more ascetic, and, uh, and, and so on. So, in other words, it's, it's another way of um, looking at the warrior mentality, the ascetic life of a warrior and a priest, and, but formulated in a way that the world today, which is more secularized and which doesn't have a direct threat of invasion and so on, so doesn't have warriors in the old sense, but these values that were the values of the priest and the warriors are certainly now being picked up by uh, the green. Rainbow know. warrior. Rainbow warrior, <laughs> exactly. That's right. So, um, yes. yeah, um, Christian, I come back to your point about the old order breaking down. You seem very optimistic about that because I, I subscribe to the opinion, which I think you would agree. That ultimately the state, the ideology that it produces and so on, is ultimately there to defend the interests of a given class. I think that was Marx's analysis, I think, of the state. And I don't see any evidence of the state diminishing or of the, the class order in society diminishing. If anything, if once upon a time the state served to kind of regulate both the conflict between the producers and the owners and also between the owners themselves, what you have seen in modern capitalist society is the growth of monopolies, huge global monopolies, and they seem to be embedded by the state. An example of it, if you take the banking crisis, where the state intervened to, in a great expense to the taxpayer, to prop up these banks. And if you look at the, and if, even in modern society, you've had the growth of the media, and the recent revelation about the Murdoch empire, and now deeply intertwined, that, in, that media conglomerate was with politicians and so on. If anything, the state has expanded. You know, you gave the example of um, the kind of, remote electronic cyberspace wars conducted from in a Nevada, a desert in Nevada somewhere over Afghanistan and Pakistan. <coughs> I don't see any, any evidence of a disintegration of the monopoly of big business and the state at all, and I don't see it anywhere. Yes, I think that Probably, if you were visiting France on the 12th of July, 1789, you would see that you know Versailles was happy. Uh, people were having balls and fireworks and uh, all these sort of things, and the noblemen were you know running in their carriages. And um, so it is a situation you have to look sort of at, at, at a more global picture, and and especially you have to look at the difference between the discourse, the ideology, and the reality that is being perceived. And I think that what more and more people are experiencing today is that the people who represent the state 
members of parliament, high officials, European Central Bank, you know, all these people, are telling them things that do not correspond to real experience, I mean, to real life experience. And this is where you start a revolution. In other words, in, eight, in 1985, 1986, in the Soviet Union, I mean, I lived there for you know, a number of years after uh, 1989, and people were saying, we realized that all that stuff the Communist Party was telling us about, you know, we are ahead, we are doing and so on, it didn't, you know, we, we, we couldn't believe it. You know, we couldn't believe that the Americans were behind us, that, uh, you know, things like that. They, they were, they, there was too many, or there were too many signs that the discourse was not reflecting reality. And I think that today when governments say, you know, we are fighting unemployment, we will do, people say, you, you can't. It's not in your power to do this. And um, that is when you have a pre-revolutionary situation. Now, it may not turn out the way we would like, because we are not doing, or we don't have a means to do, what we should or we ought to be doing as an avant-garde. In other words, when people no longer believe the official discourse, the dominant ideology, they are looking for an alternative ideology, which give account, gives account of a reality. I think that libertarians or street economics, all these sort of things, gives a better account of a new reality of a globalized world and IT world you know, and, and so on, information and so on. But if it's not out there where people can find it, they will turn to some other ideology. I don't know what that will be. But I think the nation-state ideology, even the democratic ideology in the sense of nation-state electing you know, and so on, that is no longer working. People know that you know, they, they vote here for something and it doesn't matter whether they vote Peter, Paul, John, and so on. They, they would be better off voting for the guy in Beijing or the guy in Washington who has more influence on what they are, is happening here, you know, and so on. So the people they elect are now restricted to small things, you know, deciding whether you can drink in public parks or deciding whether you can smoke in pubs. That's, that is the extent of their power. If they decide you can no longer smoke in pubs, that will be enforced. If they decide we are going to create, you know, a technological Britain, mm -hmm. or we are going to reduce unemployment, or we are, forget it, not in your power. Indirectly, first of all. Uh, Pat and then this lady here. Pat, first, first of all. Pat? Yeah, um, I, I, I'm just a, a little confused, actually, by what you, by what you mean by warriors. And this is talking about warriors, priests, and putting all these people in different categories. I mean, surely, I mean, for, for example, in the nuclear age, surely we're all warriors. I mean, now we're all in the front line, or we were, we were at least, certainly in the Cold War. Um, I mean, priests, of just as much chance of being vaporized, the soldiers had. Um, and there was a reaction to that as well. I mean, uh, even for example, in the, in the First World War, uh, you see women getting involved in um, uh, recruitment of soldiers. Um, actually, that's another thing I want to bring up. And that is that where do you see your warriors? Stuck in the mud or? Uh, looking up at the uh, top of the mountains. I wasn't quite clear about that. Oh, well, very clearly, of course, the warriors are the people who are very much at the mountain top. Because... Um, no, is, is, it, is that a recent thing? Or is that no, no, that's always been, been there. Right. I mean, 
in the sense that what interest do they have? I mean, I understand what Bob was saying. We, we all act out. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. I mean, traditionally, you take the traditional idea of the soldier right mm. throughout history. His big thing is that if you uh, engage in military service, he'd have food, he'd have drink, and he'd have women. Those are the three big things. I mean, they, they actually took women with them even as recently as the Crimean War, mm. uh, 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 Britain against Russia in the uh, 1860s. Um, you would have women there, and they'd be available, mm. as with beer and as with cigarettes. Mm. In fact, even very recently, if you see uh, some of the alternative uh, screenings of World War I, uh, one old soldier on there recently said, well, you know, he said, um, what they don't tell you about, he said, is that we had uh, a great time in the First World War. He said, we had free beer, free cigarettes, as much women as we wanted, because we went to Paris all the time. He said, it was only in the front, he said, it was only in the front trench where you could get killed. All the trenches behind, where we were, we were ordinance. He said, you had no trouble at all. You had the odd bombing, shelling, but he said, it was usually shelling was prearranged stuff. They'd actually ring the German lines and tell them when they were going to shell and the Germans would do the opposite mm. so they could move away because they know the time the Germans were going to, were going to do this mm. and he said but best of all he said I got away from the missus for four years yes <laughs> well now mm. uh, plunder and wealth and everything else even in the I mean the navy for example the royal navy was renowned for that you got the ship you got the gold Spanish gold and what have you it was yours or uh, certain part of it was yours. Um, the reason they had to press gang is because the, uh, the women were missing, apparently. In the, in the army, they didn't have that trouble. Mm. Uh, they didn't have to press gang people in the army because uh, they had uh, the three things that these guys wanted. Mm. The Navy, they didn't. You know, that's the alternative view of that. It was only in 1916 that they introduced conscription. Um, because they were losing large amounts of people. Mm. Um, but I, I wonder, I'm just on that, those technical sides. Come on, uh, let's have a question, uh, Pastor. <laughs> it's actually correct. I mean, rather than having their head in the mountains, I think a lot of these people would have their uh, feet in the mud. But, but I'll give you a, a, just a little twist on that. A little one? A little twist, <laughs> yeah. Um, the suicide, especially with the, with the working classes, actually free falls once they join the army. You know, if you, you do the epidemiological analysis. Mm. I mean, you have got uh, camaraderie. It does give them something to live for. Mm. You know, it's something to stop them committing suicide. Now, suicide does get to be a big problem in uh, social housing, joblessness, uh, with, with, with a lot of the, uh, when you take away a lot of the reasons to live, for especially young people, young males especially. Mm. Uh, well, I mean, Do bring this yeah, to a conclusion, uh, but if you can. If, if you take that away, the, the uh, suicide rate absolutely rockets. Mm. But it drops like a stone once you militarize these people. Now, that hasn't been adequately well, you've just given the explanation very clearly. In other words, once they are militarized, they have a cause. They are no longer in uh, the sort of, you know, day-to-day -day sort of, you know, wallowing in, in the bog. Suddenly, as they are militarized, they have a cause. They have something to look for. And I think that, yes, we get free beer. And what you said about women was that, you know, what the Japanese call comfort women, prostitutes. That is not really what people want. It's not the delights of, you know, a, a, a life with children, with family, and so on. But, but Some that, people wanted to get away from the missus, maybe. But that hasn't been the view of the British Army right throughout the centuries. I mean, it's only a very recent thing. Well, and, and even even today, 
um, soldiers with medals are considered, you know, a, a, a very high honour. They're given these privileges. That That's right. Talking. Yes, exactly. Mm. That's my point. Bob? I think, I think it was a leading one. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, yes. oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> that went on so long that I've forgotten. I beg your pardon. The lady, yes. Simple, simple question. Um, if you think that the audience is underrepresented in the well, a, um, I think it is. I think a, cla a, a classless society would simply be a society where everyone would be living under the same rights. In other words, the same law applies to everybody, which is not the case today. The case today is that you have people who are allowed to do certain things that other people are not allowed to. In other words, you have a class of people who can knock on my door at five o'clock in the morning and tell me, you haven't paid this or you haven't done that and we are going to take this away from you. I cannot do the same to them. So in other words, our rights are not identical. A classless society is a class where everybody has identical rights to everybody else. But I, I have a feeling like people with lots of money and power, they will always be on the top. Because they have money, they will always be on the top. Because they have the people who are capable of making money yeah, to become rich, and the poor people who are incapable of making money, they'll be jealous. So there will be war, there will be class differences all the time. Well, it's not class differences, it's differences between individuals. I mean, you could be jealous of your little friend who is succeeding better at school than you are, or a footballer who is better than you are playing football or a, uh, you know, and, and, and so on. It is a difference in uh, quantity. More beauty, more talents, more skills, more money. But it is not a difference of nature. They have certain rights that I do not have. And that is what breaks societies apart that certain people have certain rights that are denied other people. And you, all these differences in rights are created by the state. You are a national or you are a foreigner. If you are a foreigner, you don't have the same rights. You are part of a ruling class of state employees, their lackeys and so on, and you get certain privileges like you can take money from others or you can, you know, boss them around and so on. Others do not. So, yes. For most, uh, most of the cases, I think, the people with money, they can buy it. Money can buy power. Money can buy privilege. Well, money doesn't buy privileges. Um, what, what money does is that it buys goods, more goods. It may give you a power which is economic power. And what capitalism has done is create very clearly two types of power. You have economic power, which is the power to serve. If, for instance, I want a loan from HSBC, and HSBC grants me that loan, HSBC has a power over me. It can say every month you have to repay that much. But if I don't want a loan from HSBC, it has no power over me. If I'm employed by somebody, then that somebody can say, you know, you have to be at 8 o'clock every morning doing this, that, and the other. But if I don't want to work with that person, 
person has no power over me. But the small custom official at Heathrow, I don't want to have anything with him. I don't want to see him. But he can stop me, open my bag, you know, ask me questions, and, and so on. So economic power is a power to serve. Political power is a power to constrain. It is a power to coerce. And the limit of economic power is the service you render. No service, no power. The limit of political power is the death of a victim. That is how far it can go. Conscription, conscription shooting at you, you know, all these sort of things, jailing you. So there is a difference between economic power and political power. And with capitalism, actually, there is another form of power that, have emerged, that has emerged. And it's feminine power, it's women power. It's interesting, actually, that capitalism arose at the same time as the first feminist authors, Jane Austen, Wilson's Craft, uh, Olympe de Gouges, you know, all these people came exactly at the time of the Industrial Revolution. It is a power of seduction, which capitalism is very good at. And, of course, it's sort of, you know, essentialism to say that women are seduction and, uh, and so on. Men also seduce. But there is, in capitalism, a way of presenting things which is seductive, advertising and, 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 and so on. But isn't that better, that form of, let's call it feminine power, than the power of a stick, the power of a boot, the power of a gun? Bob? Uh, there was a question earlier that we, I think we ought to somehow... Libertarians spend so much time talking to each other that we, there's an awful lot we don't have to spell out because we already we have a background of, of knowledge or belief. Um, but the question about, say, um, monopoly power and the ties between great corporations and companies in the state is it's a fair one. But it seems to me, reading, especially reading the American literature, but uh, elsewhere in the world, that libertarian um, authors, especially those informed from decent economics, are the very best at doing what Marxists only vaguely gesture at and very rarely do, which is to point out the nuts and bolts of how this company gets this tariff, this regulation, helps select the people who form the um, supervisory boards, lobbies here, lobbies there, buys up votes, uh, helps fund a political campaign. It's precisely the <coughs> libertarians who are the best at seeing how these monopolies are brought about, how the how the, um, the corporatists make use of the state. Is that, is that not the case? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely correct. Unfortunately, our voice is not heard far and, you know, uh, enough. So, um, but yes. Is there anyone else who wants to make a contribution or ask a question? Oh, yes. I see a bit of a paradox in problem I have with the libertarian project, although you know, I see myself more as a social libertarian, so I don't understand the other variety very much. But there is a view in the current political debate about the state, um, not qualified because I'm not sure how real the debate is, but there is one view that the state, as the protector, as the way to eliminate class society, create equality, and, and so on, through ever expansion. I think it's a false ideology, but people believe it that the way to liberate society from all these problems is to rely more and more on the state, whereas I think the solution is reverse to actually eliminate the state. But once you in eliminating the state and visualising the kinds of society that might come from it, I think is problematic for libertarians. However, I think the paradox is if the state has these lofty morals, the top of the mountain morals, I think a stateless society would require a similar lofty moral, a collective moral, morality based on 
humanity being at the top of the mountain, genuine freedom, genuine freedom from the jackboots or the custom officials. <coughs> but it, I'm not sure if the Libertarian Project entirely is based on that, or it's based on some other economic model, which I think wouldn't necessarily be aspire to the top of the mountain approach. Yes, I think it is. Uh, there, there are two questions there. I think one is there are many people who are not interested in making a lot of money. And, you know, we, we see it today in, in society. I mean, people who become nurses, people who become teachers, people who become, you know, whatever, they know they are not going to make a lot of money. That is not what they are interested in. They are interested in doing research, in doing scholarly, you know, uh, pursuits and, and all these sort of things. And that is perfectly acceptable. It is not the amount of money you make. It is how you make it that is important. And some people, for instance, would like life, you know, in Christ or life in Buddha or, uh, you know, the, 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 this sort of thing. And it is perfectly acceptable. But the morality of a producer is very strict. Quality, fairness, um, pay your debts, you know, honor your commitments, punctuality, all these sort of things, this discipline is, I think, contains very high values and is very important. It's the respect you have to others, respect you have to your suppliers, respect you have to your financiers, to your clients, to your employees, and so on. So there is, in a libertarian society, a scale of value which I think is just as demanding as that of a priest, of a warrior, except that it doesn't ask you to sacrifice your life. It asks you to um, enhance your life, to bring your life to incandescence, to you know, the highest it can do in the service of others. Because that is economic power, as I said earlier. It is the service you can render others. That is what you are asked to do in a capitalist and a libertarian society. How do you can be of service to others? And that is very demanding. Um, well, I, I could go on. But <laughs> I think we... Um... Any, anyone else who wants to make a contribution or ask a question? Come on, let's have one more. Yeah, but... Let's be fair to Marx and give him a, a further kicking. Um, <laughs> he may have eventually seen through Marxism, or some of the economics, but I don't think he ever <coughs> abandoned socialism. He thought that capitalism was inefficient, immoral, ruthless, wrong-headed, meddlesome, war warring, led to wars, colonialism, empires, the rest of it. But he did believe in socialism. But he had sufficient economics and sufficient intelligence to have seen through socialism. And he never made the effort. I don't... Well, he did. He, I mean, Marx saw through socialism, but he called it utopian socialism. Mm. And he himself, in uh, his uh, 1859 work, the... Uh, forerunner of the capital, mm. puts the economic calculation argument mm. against the utopian socialists. And Ingalls repeats this in the preface to The Poverty of Philosophy, mm. uh, where Ingalls puts the economic calculation argument, as well as Mises ever did, uh, against the utopian socialists. So if it's going to be solved in the future, the future But the point, is, well, the point is he had this Aristotelian outlook, because he's far more of an Aristotelian than Hegel, although Hegel himself is an Aristotelian. Mm. But we cannot... Um, right recipes for the cookshops of the future. Yes, that's it. It's going to emerge, and the well, place where it's, I won't have any recipes. Well, the place where it's going to emerge is what this chat here says. He, this chat still thinks that there are growing monopolies, but of course, percentage-wise, the monopolies uh, in 1818 and in 1883, that's when Marx was born and when Marx died, roughly the same, and that's roughly the same worldwide as it is today. In other words, there's been no growth in democracy since 1800 till today, none whatsoever. What you do have 
uh, is what Mark's seen and what this gent here has probably seen, namely some firms do get bigger, but then what you have is what we, is what uh, enough of us are old enough to experience with, say, Lyons uh, Coffee Shop, which has now been replaced by McDonald's, but you know, Lyons just collapsed in a year, and all of those, I mean, there were 16 of them <coughs> in Birmingham, they went within a year. Uh, mm -hmm. Lyons made, uh, you know, Smith's crisps were replaced by uh, Water by Golden Wonder, and then Golden Wonder vanished, and now it's Walkers and so on. And you know now it's Tesco's up at the top. You know, but uh, in the 1960s it was Trident and so on. You know, supermarkets just vanished. Gateway has just vanished. Uh, so you get uh, 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 the economies of scale, which Marx saw and loved. And for Marx, uh, it was just the bigger the better. It's about you know we're going to get more and more economies of scale. And the people who are going to uh, destroy capitalism are these giant firms. Because they will leave the market, they'll leave the market behind because they're so big, and they'll work out something else. But of course what Marx overlooked is the diseconomies of scale on the other side, where a firm gets too big, and indeed it does leave the market, and through leaving the market, it leaves economic calculation behind, and it becomes more uh, inefficient than the smaller firms. And so therefore, you know, these big giants don't continue to grow and grow and grow like Marx thought. They go to a peak, what Lyons did, and, and then they collapse, and they're replaced by others. You know, now you've got uh, McDonald's, and McDonald's now has given way, to, has fallen to Subway, which is coming up, and so on, and so so on. It goes on, and heaven knows what's going to be the top dog in 20 years' time. Uh, it might even be uh, still Tesco's in the supermarkets, or it might not be. We do not know. Mm. But what we do know is that the Tesco's suffer, suffer as all big firms do, from the thing that Marx overlooked for all his reading, and that's the diseconomies of scale mm. and innovation. An innovation which displaces. Oh, yeah, but uh, yeah. he didn't overlook the innovation. He, in fact, he was expecting innovation. He was expecting the innovation well, that didn't come around. <laughs> now, the innovation of communism or socialism mm. that didn't come around. He was expecting that innovation, but it didn't come. Mm. And it didn't. And nothing like it, nothing remotely like it has come. And of course, I'm on the opposite side of the lady who said that uh, there must be a class. I think that Marx's class struggle doesn't work. There's nothing like or even remotely like the class struggle anywhere in history. And what you do get is exactly what uh, Christian said when he said you get differences of different envy between different peoples. And even Ingalls pointed out, and pointed out many times, that envy arises not between the top and the bottom, but when closeness together. Yeah. We, 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 we uh, uh, you know, Christian said in his answer, we, uh, the other lad who's taking the same examination as us, we envy him. The other lad who's in the same football team as him. As us, we envy him. We don't envy Manchester United, Rooney. He's too good to envy. He's too far ahead of us. Mm. You know, I envy the next chess player. I don't, I don't uh, envy Stephen Berry, for example. <laughs> Only a few people who understand you know Stephen will understand that, what that means. Yeah, but there's also envy between countries, like... Uh, yes, but near countries. Well, yeah. And, of course, what is strange, I mean, the war studies... Yes. Um, I mean, the United States gets, you know, it's, I don't know, 280 million people. So um, it's, uh, some people are not envious, they are doing very well in the United States training with China and, uh, and, and so on. But, but again, there you are looking at states. So if you didn't have states, by definition, you wouldn't have the United States. So um, you would have something that would be very different. You still would have government. I think we, we need to make a distinction between states and governments. Um, there are a lot of governments, you know, corporations, the Vatican, uh, Vatican, uh, you know, uh, big uh, multinational, big uh, NGOs. They all have governments. They all have structures where you have a group of people who are coordinating activities and things like that. But they don't have a monopoly of violence. They are there only in as much as their government can serve the people they are working with. If the people don't like that government, call it management if you want, then they would leave. You know, they would go to another firm or do something else. Whereas you can't easily tell the you know, UK government 
thank you very much, I resign. No, no longer send me invoices, you know. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for your previous customer. <laughs> That's right. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you. Thank you also.